In the previous module, what we really focused on was kind of the basic structure and then how a muscle works, so how it contracts um, at the very basic molecular level. Today we're going to move into a little bit of a, a more applied sense. We're going to talk about actually force production, what that force production looks like, um, how the body senses uh, when these contractions are going, and then last but not least we'll, we'll finish up on um, some very true exercise physiology and talk about what happens uh, to, to skeletal muscle as we do endurance training or resistance type training. So the first thing that we're going to start today uh, is going to be proprioception. Uh, the objectives for this uh, brief section, uh, which is only going to be a few slides, is that you need to be able to de define uh, proprioception. So what does that mean? Um, and second, you need to understand how muscle spindles and GTOs provide feedback to um, neural pathways and how they are able to control um, muscle length um, through those, um, through their uh, sensory pathways. So first, let's talk about uh, proprioception. So simply, we can de define proprioception um, as a very general concept of how the body senses where it is in space. Um, and while this is something that we take for granted, realistically, our body really needs this in order to have any clue um, on how to perform daily actions. And you can do just, you know, a very brief. Um, demonstration on yourself. You can close your eyes and you can lift your arms and you actually have a pretty good grasp on where your arms are at all points in, at all points in times. Um, and that's because uh, your muscles are sending signals to your brain. Your brain, really, really powerful organ, as we know, has the ability to take some of these sensory feedbacks coming from the muscle, combine it with maybe that motor plan that you used, um, integrate all of this in such that such a way that you have a really good understanding of where your arms um, uh, are at that moment in time, uh, despite not really being able to see them. Again, all feedback, uh, a lot of that feedback is coming uh, from the muscles. So what that feedback truly is, is um, telling the brain essentially um, the amount of force um, or the amount of stretch that's being going on and applied in that muscle so that you can um, then know what length uh, that muscle is. Uh, we have two main proprioceptors that we're going to cover in this class, um, and that is looking at receptors located in the muscle and then receptors located in the tendons. And again, uh, the information from these um, are sent into the um, central nervous system, so they'll go into uh, the spinal cord and then up to the brain and can be either conscious or subconscious as we, we talk about reflexes later on. You'll see that the, many of those are, are subconscious. Uh, again, and also one of the uh, really important parts of proprioception is, is the learning effect. And the book uh, describes this pretty well as the idea to uh, repeat uh, specific motor unit recruitment patterns, especially as we talk about uh, doing any kind of um, athletic performance is that if you practice these and practice these, then uh, these proprioceptors uh, can have a couple of different effects. But one, you can learn that skill uh, in a movement pattern. And, and two, you can uh, maybe have the ability to kind of um, uh, disengage some of the uh, proprioceptive feedback. And we'll talk about that uh, later in the Golgi tendon section. So the first one that we're going to talk about is the muscle spindle. Muscle spindle is the proprioceptor, is the primary and only proprioceptor in skeletal muscle. Uh, so it uh, has uh, essentially two functions. It monitors the stretch or the length of the muscle. Uh, that's kind of the, the same thing. And then the second function is to initiate a contraction uh, when the muscle is uh, is stretched. So this is one of those subconscious reflexes, right? So if we uh, stretch a muscle and then we contract it, you can think about this easily. The um, uh, very uh, easy analogy to think about here is the um, the knee tap reflex, right? When you go to the doctor, they tap on your your tendon uh, with the um, with that tapping, uh, you actually stretch the muscle as the tendon pulls, um, and then you get a quick reflex of the quadriceps where it then contracts and your knee raises. Again, that's um, a very uh, very accurate subconscious reflex. Um, so how do these work and how do we kind of break them down? Um, to be honest, in your textbook, figure 414 is a really, really, really beautiful picture of a muscle spindle, but they do a pretty bad job of explaining all the moving parts that they choose to list. They list about 20 different things on the right side, and realistically, it's a really confusing uh, figure, I think, for the students. So um, 
this is actually the, the figure that I have here is the top half of the next page, figure 415. And I think it does a much better um, job explaining, much simpler. Uh, and so I'm going to use this to walk through. Uh, you can look through 414, but I really recommend looking through 415 as we walk through this um, on there. Okay, so uh, lots of parts. So first, um, the muscle spindle has another name. We'll call it an intrafusal muscle fiber. That's because within kind of your whole muscle, the muscle spindle actually sits in the middle between all of your um, typical contracting muscle fibers that we really talked about um, last week. Um, so um, again, I don't always love the namings of these things as I, I talked about last week. So we have the intrafusal fiber and then the opposite, of course, would be an extrafusal fiber. You can just go ahead and label extrafusal fiber as uh, your normal muscle fibers, right? Those are the ones doing the contracting. The intrafusal fiber is this muscle spindle that lays uh, in parallel, uh, right in between uh, the skeletal muscle itself, hence the name intrafusal fiber. So the intrafusal fiber, fiber is innervated by a um, type 1A afferent neuron. So you should remember from um, A and P that afferent really means sensory. Right, so this is going to be providing uh, sensory feedback, and then the ones that are going to be causing movement are our motor neurons. So our afferent uh, is going to come, uh, is going to be innervated by our, is going to innervate our interfusal fiber, um, send uh, information about the stretch and length of that muscle back into the spinal cord here. Um, the spinal cord then can as you can see by some of the, the green, uh, can send information again up to the brain in order to provide um, feedback. And so our brain can edit that. And we can also have reflexes, right? So we have um, two options. So here we can actually affect an alpha motor neuron. What we're calling an alpha motor neuron is what's going to be innervating our extrafusal muscle fibers. Uh, so in my example of the knee tap, right, we get a stretch here, afferent neuron uh, goes here. Um, talks to the gamma motor or the alpha motor neuron and that causes a contraction in the quad once we tap the tendon on the knee. Um, and then uh, so one other important thing that the muscle spindle has is um, is it is really responses to a change in length, right? So to be able to be responsive for a change in length, let's say for example uh, you sit for a really long time and then maybe you're in uh, that case in your muscles in a very relaxed position. Um, at that point, uh, any uh, change in the stretch may not be able to be um, demonstrated. We'll see this a little bit better on the next figure. And so in order to do that, the extrafuse or the interfusal muscle spindle can actually contract a little bit in order to make sure kind of that, uh, if we picture this as like a, a spring, that's a good way to look at this in the muscle, is that this spring can be stretched or, or relaxed, but ultimately there's kind of this optimal length to where it can detect small movement and changes. If you've been sitting for a while, maybe that spring becomes compressed and it takes a while uh, of that muscle stretching before you actually uh, get any change in length of the spring. So what it can do is it, it can actually also innervate a gamma motor neuron this gamma motor neuron is specifically going to innervate only the uh, muscle spindle and allow it to kind of change shape such that it can kind of stay in that optimal length um, position. Uh, so one of the uh, examples that I think why this is important for exercise and performance is, is really great. So we can, obviously we can have reflexes to where, um, uh, you know, maybe uh, it could be beneficial if, if there's a harm, but can we actually use this for sport? And uh, I think they give a, a great example in the textbook about being a pitcher. So taking advantage of this, when you get this unexpected stretch, then your muscles will automatically kind of contract um, in response to that. And so they, they use the example of, of, uh, of a pitcher, right? So using the wind up to kind of torque the body, cause a stretch in the um, in the shoulder muscles, um, and then as they deliver the pitch, then you get an added uh, muscle contraction just from that stretch. So I think that's a really good example of not only how it can be harmful, but also uh, be uh, used to its benefit in exercise. So again, here's our muscle spindle, and this is um, just the idea um, that I was uh, kind of talking about, that it has the ability to move itself, uh, and it also is able to send signals. So when we get a large stretch, you'll see the number of um, 
uh, electrical impulses or action potentials being sent from the um, uh, type 1 afferent muscle fiber back to the um, the central nervous system uh, rapidly increases and you get a lot of action potentials telling uh, the uh, central nervous system that we are uh, heavily stretching that muscle. Um, in the normal state or kind of the relaxed resting state, you'll see that there's a pattern when we contract or shorten the muscle, then this pattern goes away and we get very few action potentials set. So again, uh, this would be in a single case, but Ultimately, if you're sitting there long term, what the goal is to kind of get that muscle spindle um, back into a relaxed state using um, the gamma motor neuron to actually cause uh, contraction or relaxation of that muscle spindle to make sure that it's an optimal link to detect either stretching of the muscle or contracting of the muscle. So the other proprioceptive, proprioception um, organ that we're going to talk about is the GTO or the Golgi tendon organ. Uh, this is located in tendons and its primary purpose is to provide feedback on the amount of force that a muscle is generating. So um, if you kind of think back to a little bit of muscle contraction, muscle structure and function yesterday, and also your anatomy and physiology, right? The way that a um, um, that we produce movement is to have a strong contraction to a, um, of a muscle that then pulls on a bone against a lever arm. Pulling on that bone is effective through the tendon. So if we can put a um, some type of sensor in our tendon that stretches um, and can feel that amount of force, uh, then we are able to know uh, how strong the contraction arm skeletal muscles are generating. Um, so again, uh, that's exactly what the Golgi tendon organ does in itself. Its main function is to monitor and respond um, to um, tension or force generated by the muscle uh, that's being pulled on through the, um, through the tendon. So this is, uh, again, there's the top half of the um, spindle and the bottom half of this figure is the Golgi tendon organ. I think, again, these are, um, are pretty uh, uh, well-drawn figures. So we have our, our Golgi tendon organ that is inside of our, um, our skeletal, our, our tendon uh, that's attached to our skeletal muscle. So when we pull, you can kind of think of this as a force transducer if anyone's ever uh, worked with anything like that. But essentially when the muscle pulls, it pulls on the tendon. Um, the Golgi tendon organ has, again, a sensory afferent neuron. Again, afferents are sensory fibers. Uh, that go back to the central nervous system. As opposed to the muscle spindle, uh, the GTO does not have any type of um, gamma motor neuron coming in to alter uh, its uh, size and shape. So this is just a sensory organ, has no mo motor uh, capabilities, uh, can only send messages about how, um, how hard the muscle is contracting. Uh, it does have the ability to um, affect the um, alpha motor neurons. Uh, so the alpha motor neurons, again, uh, if you remember from the last slide, those are the ones that are innervating our extrafusal or our normal contracting skeletal muscles. Uh, it innervates those um, such that uh, the idea is that these Golgi tendon organs are really important by in, in, in inhibiting the action of muscle to prevent injury. Uh, what it's saying is at some point during really high excessive force, um, your body is saying if you keep producing this much force, then there's a chance that our tendon will actually rip from our bone, um, and therefore the Golgi tendon organs are kind of a safety mechanism in preventing that. Uh, and so there are some um, kind of new training techniques. Uh, if you're interested, you can kind of look those up on your own, but the idea is that you can kind of decrease the inhibition of this force that GTOs are trying to send, right? So they sense force, they send a message through their afferent neuron, uh, into the central nervous system, which then sends um, an inhibitory set, uh, uh, synapse into the gamma motor or into the alpha motor neuron, into the extrafusal fibers to stop it from contracting. And so, if you can prevent that, then you can uh, potentially increase performance. Of course, uh, this can be bad. Um, I am not a fan of uh, violent, violent videos uh, or injuries. In fact, I really hate watching them. I can deal with a lot, but really watching injuries freaks me out for some unknown reason. Um, and so I won't be playing any of those, but there are plenty of YouTube examples of, of people where um, they have actually generated such a strong muscle contraction that the tendon can actually rip away from the bone. And what's happening there is, is their body has been trained 
long enough that they can actually prevent um, this uh, GTO from inhibiting any muscle contractions. They can produce a contraction so strong that it causes damage.